Stefan, we are back in time with you again. Good morning everybody, welcome to my talk. My name is Stefan Schulz and I'm going to be talking about a rather high level problem compared to the other folks we've already heard. Um, there's a special kind of bug which is called a stealth bug, um, coined by Mark Eisenstadt. And what makes these bugs so special is that they destroy their own evidence, meaning that once you observe the symptom, there's no way of finding out what the cause was because it is gone already. So let me let me explain this really quick with a quick example. So suppose you want to implement a random number generator for positive integers in a certain in a certain range. First, you generate the, the value, make sure that it is positive, and map it to the range by calculating its modulo, modulo to the parameter of n, which specifies the range. Seems quite innocent, doesn't it? So when you when you execute it, for example, parameter 10, at <coughs> some point, point you might encounter this. A negative value. How come how comes? Let us find out. First, with live debugging, so these are your, your debuggers integrated into, into your IDE. We could use a breakpoint which will trigger a method exit if the result is negative. So when the breakpoint triggers, we can, uh, we can inspect the execution environment and see, well, the argument was 10, the result was minus 8. So there's nothing we learned from that. We could try expression evaluation. Um, Eclipse, for example, offers a feature called inspect where you can, while you're executing the program, select certain expressions and, let, and have them evaluated. But very likely this will yield another result. That's, that is because this code is simply executed. And this means that the random, uh, the next int, will return a different value, very likely. Something else we can do with live debugging. We could try using a, a regular breakpoint, which will hold the execution right before the expression is executed. So we see the environment again, which is parameter 10. And if we step through the code, we get a different result. Again, um, next in the very likely um, uh, return a different result, which won't lead to the bug. Is there something else we can do? Well, we could make sure that nobody's watching us because we're about to commit a major crime in software engineering. <laughs> which is print line debugging. We just basically butchered our code. But even though this is so frowned upon and heavily discussed whether you should or you shouldn't do it, at some point the console will print this output. <coughs> we have our result again and uh, twice the same value. So something seems to go wrong when our random num uh, when, when next int returns this value and it is passed to method apps. So we got a clue out of this and nowhere to look at. So let's have a look at, at the implementation of apps. If you pass a negative argument, um, it is simply multiplied by minus one. Now that we know which uh, values cause the problem, we can manually feed them in this, in this method. So our, our argument is negative. We take the first branch and multiply it by minus one. But this is not an integer anymore, because the integer range goes um, one number smaller. It's, this is minus 2 to the 31, which is the minimum integer value, and this is plus 2 to the 31, which is not the maximum integer value. This is actually um, 2 to the 31 plus uh, minus 1. So we are one off, and this causes an, causes an overhead. So even though print line debugging it's so, it's so heavily discussed, it actually helped us finding out what the problem was. It, it gave us the means to basically debug back in time. We could, we could observe the problem and take a look backwards to see what was happening earlier. And this idea was picked up on by omniscient debugging. If you imagine the execution as a timeline where 
uh, method invocations, method returns, and some events in between. If you, if you record all of this, you can get a representation of what was happening at which time at which time in the execution. So let me uh, present this as a table. Um, if you now pick out a timestamp you are interested in, for example, uh, the return event of, of the apps function, you can see what was going on at that time. This is a great idea, basically, but the problem is that it doesn't scale really well. We have at minimum an over, uh, a runtime overhead of a factor of 20, <coughs> and that is if you have a big cluster in the background which can handle the traces because they grow really large. So we need to find an approach where we can have back-in-time evaluation but without the cost that uh, omniscient debugging brings. And this is where our approach comes into play. Um, we call it back-in-time evaluation. And it is designed to integrate into your regular debugger which is integrated into your IDE. So there's not, not much overhead for using it, there's not much overhead for setting it up. Um, and the basic idea is, if you, if you use this, uh, this breakpoint again, and earlier I showed you um, eva uh, expression evaluation, what if instead of re-executing the code, we return the value that previously uh, was returned by this expression? How do we do this? Basically, we, we cheat. It's the same idea as print and debugging where we author the code, but instead of authoring the source code, we author the bytecode via bytecode instrumentation. And if you have an operation which uh, yields a result, we simply copy it uh, from the stack and store it to a new local variable. Meaning that you uh, store your traces in the stack instead of externally, for example, you using a, da a database. And um, in conclusion, the, the traces are available at runtime. So let's take, let's take a step back and, and look at, at the overall picture. Um, when a source code is compiled by a Java compiler, it generates a bytecode representation of this code. And this can be executed by the JVM. When the JVM is launched, it loads uh, the bytecode instrumentation, it initializes bytecode instrumentation, for example, in the form of a Java agent, um, which, when the bytecode the byte of a class is loaded, adds the instructions mentioned earlier, and um, so they are, they are available when, when the JVM executes the bytecode. And during execution, you can connect with your debugger, which reads the state of the program and controls the execution. And in order to incorporate the, the variables added by the bytecode instrumentation, we need to extend the debugger. Notice, so this is basically the back end, which does the instrumentation, and this is the front end, what the, what the debugger, uh, what the uh, developer can see during debugging. Uh, notice, there is no connection between the two. And this is because they use different representations of the, of the application. Um, the bytecode instrumenter uses, obviously, the bytecode uh, representation of the application. And uh, the UI extension, so the user interface for the developer, uses the source code representation. Bytecode is in sequential order, and source code is in lexical order, meaning that Next in, for example, comes first in the bytecode representation, but second in the source code representation. But, uh, and, and likewise, apps come second in the bytecode representation, but first in the source code representation. Um, how do we solve this? When we add um, the variables, we choose clever names in order to help the, the uh, front end identify which variable belongs to which um, method call. So in this case, uh, random next int, well, there's only a, a one execution each, so the, the, the ID here does not really help. But um, suppose there, there were more uh, invocations of next int, uh, this number would come up. And 
the cool thing is if uh, the, the, the front end traverses the source code in the same way as, as the agent would. So in, in bytecode order, in, in sequential execution order, it can map the variables in the debugging information uh, to the method calls. <coughs> Okay, so this solves one of the, the first, pro uh, one, uh, first problem I showed you that uh, online debuggers don't have back in time cap capabilities. What about the second problem? Um, problem of omniscient debuggers that they do not scale very well. Um, for that, we implemented a prototype which uh, is a kind of um, is a, is a proof of concept, it's an early prototype. And we ran benchmarks for it. Um, these benchmarks consist of, of single method calls, and these method calls are only one statement. So there's only a return statement, and the methods uh, return the value of, it, of, a, of a special type or of a certain type. And even though these these bars seem a little bit uh, displaced, um, notice that, that the execution time is in nanoseconds. So the runtime overhead uh, introduced by, by our tool is, is 10 in the worst case. This is the worst case because we only have one instruction uh, in the method calls and uh, the, uh, the overhead uh, imposed by, by the implementation weighs more for, for such minimal implementation. Okay. So, let me summarize what I showed you. Uh, back in time evaluation um, lets you inspect operation results retrospectively. And uh, the interim results are stored in the call stack, and our performance uh, overhead is 10% in the worst case. So the reality is likely to be less than 10%. Um, some future work that, that still needs to be done is. Um, when, when we try to map the bytecode and the source code, sometimes from the source code there's implicit bytecode. Uh, for example, for string concatenation, uh, concatenation there will be um, string builders introduced in the bytecode, which are not visible in the source code. Um, at the moment, there's only support for, for each loops, which uh, imply um, uh, which imply an iterator for the collection you used in the, in the loop. And uh, we need a better strategy for for loops. The problem with for loops is that if you use a single variable to store to store method return values or return values in general, is that it will, will always be overwritten in each iteration of this for loop. So there needs to be a, a clever strategy. We need to find a clever strategy to handle um, to handle loops and be able to um, look backward a few look backwards uh, to all of the iterations of the loop. Okay. This concludes my talk. Any questions? Okay. So, um, I understand how this works within a function, uh, but if I had a function that had a uh, that returned something that, well, that returned a value that gave me a bad result some sometime later in the process. Can I go back into that function and understand how mm. how it got its value? Um, as long as that the function call is still on the stack, so that is that is a problem. The assumption here is that um, your bug cause is still on the stack when you when you observe the symptom. Mm -hmm. So if the frame of this function already is, is gone, there's no way of, of looking back. But um, we, are think, we were thinking about um, having a history of, of how the stack uh, evolved. So basically storing, storing the, the, the stacks or storing the frames uh, for some time. Yeah, I really did that previous question. So I think that if you, the power of omniscient debugging is you can see everything yes. in the past. So it, it, you, you can also see a kind of call pass to read some breakpoint. But 
Uh, well, according to the, your answer to the previous question, you, your tool doesn't really support only part of that. Yeah, you know? and so well, my, my question is it, whether it is not serious for actual debugging or does, does it have a big deficient uh, defect of your debugging tool? Well, you have to some, somehow trace the performance issues for, for something else. And in this case, we, we narrowed uh, the back-in-time capabilities a little bit down to, to simply uh, the stack at this point. Yeah, I understand. So, to my, but, but so I, I'm, I'm just curious your experience of the power of your debugging system. Because, yes, it's, a, it's obviously it's a very good idea to restrict the region you can mm -hmm. trace back. Mm -hmm. But uh, you also lose some capability, so yes. do you think it's okay? It doesn't matter, or mm -hmm. well, because I yeah. never used the omniscient debugging for my practical debugging. So. Mm -hmm. oh. I think it depends. It's at, at the moment it is for a special kind of bug where where you lose the evidence. Omniscient debugging is is of course far more more powerful in that case than you can simply replay the execution uh, how, 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 how many times you want and step forwards and backwards. But in this uh, in this case you still have, have live debugging. So it integrates really well into your into your existing tooling. It's it's basically an eclipse plugin which you uh, drag into your Robins folder and you're good to go. With with omission debugging there's some setup process, there's some waiting time. For example the example I've showed you um, the, the bug occurs for only one value in the entire integer range. If you try to, to use omission debugging, it will take you a long time until you observe the bug. Well, of course, um, when you use the breakpoint, it will also take a long time, but, but that time is, is much less <coughs> in this case. So you can, once, once you see what, what the problem is, or that there's a problem, you can set a breakpoint at, at, at the point of the symptom and have a look backward. Without, without much uh, um, runtime. Yes. You say back in time evaluation, and I see just remembering values. Um, mm -hmm. Am I correct? It's remembering values. Right. Okay, and uh, you're talking about computers. Mm -hmm. uh, can your tool remember and then later inspect? Uh, not doing too much, but it was for my custom class or yeah. Um. Sorry. Um, well, we benchmarked uh, for objects. Oh, okay. For, for uh, at the moment, it's not a deep copy, but you could uh, extend it to yeah. a deep copy. So, uh, if the object gets mutated. Yeah, at, at the moment it, it would be, it would also, since, since you're simply storing the reference, if you get an object. Um, yeah. that, that Can you consider uh, deep copying everything? Like, for example, I'm only interested in the, this section of code. Mm -hmm. So I know that uh, I can afford to throw from memory at the problems, mm -hmm. but I want to remember everything. So like, State uh, between every mutation of my own. Do you have some API for that, for example, so that you know, the, the debugger user or the UI user can specify what he's or she is interested in and have very precise information about the state of computation in the past for this particular section? Well, at the moment, you specify this by, by setting a breakpoint in a certain range. We, we don't have any plans for that right now, but, it, but it, that's some good input. Okay. It would be really nice to... It, it depends on, on how much uh, overway, uh, uh, on how much overhead uh, deep copying will introduce. Maybe it isn't that much of a problem. So, so you say you remember a reference, or you actually do a shallow copy of an object, and um, store a sh <coughs> shallow copy of an object? Um, uh, it's, it's, a re it's a reference. So. Um, Imagine a, uh, a method which returns an object, it's, it's a reference, it's a, it's a type rep, a reference. So the variable added by the instrumentation is also a type reference. 
this could be this could be confusing for you. When, yes, uh, this could be the results of the yeah. application. So the focus could be changed, right? Yeah. The the focus at the moment is more on the primitive primitive types, but I think um, the foundation for for more advanced types is but this is definitely the direction if you wanted to make it real for like practical applications <laughs> that would have to be explored somehow. Yeah. Right? And of course it's it's an early prototype, so <laughs> it's kind of yeah. But that's that's a real problem, yeah. So do you use it yourself? Well, for testing, <laughs> since I'm developing it, I I have to use it myself. But uh, do you also use it to develop the tool, as opposed to the tool itself is written in Java? So. Yeah, the tool itself is written in Java as well. Um, the problem is that there's uh, the, the instrumentation is done by a Java agent, which which loads all the code is executed. So I would have to debug the JVM in order to debug the instrumentation. And there's some some uh, problem with integrating uh, the tool into the case <coughs> since I have to use Equinox release and it's hard to set up uh, an environment to debug Equinox really. I've, I've had some problems with that. So. Okay, so the, what's your, I mean, besides testing, um, did you use it for developing any other larger things? So, what I want to hear is how useful is it in practice, especially since it's kind of focusing on a very specific type of stuff. Yeah, it's really interesting. It's gas performance wise, yeah, of but, um, Issue-wise, it's, it's, it's uh, specific to, to those kinds of bugs where where the online debugger doesn't suffice anymore. So it's it's basically um, uh, not the precisely free, but almost free extension to the online debugger. So basically, the the online debuggers are exploited. The, the, the power the power of, of, of those tools is exploited and simply extended by a, by a to solve these sort of kinds of problems. So it occurs to me if you did this inside the VM, you could make a much more efficient implementation mm -hmm. um, by only applying it in places where there's a breakpoint set. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that would be the next step. So after after the tool is done, I want to explore how this would behave when I'm when I implement it uh, directly into the VM. Are you aware of some of the time travel debugging work done by uh, some JavaScript virtual machines? Mm -hmm. and how it's yeah. But we can talk about it then. I would like to, yeah. to hear about that. That's the idea. <laughs> stop. <laughs> you stop as much as you want. <laughs> There's also the process of trace of the Mario is going to talk about, um, which is designed for exactly this sort of debugging to reflect uh, machine code traces mm -hmm. in hardware. Mm -hmm. So it's really fast and then you can run. But the the uh, goal of this was to, to use it online on your on your development machine. You don't need additional hardware, so you simply plug it into your development uh, setup and use it. That was that was the basic idea. Well, well I think the hardware you're talking about is just it's like the performance comes it's, right? it's, 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 oh, okay. it's just an obscure feature of a. Oh, okay. It's not a hardware. You will hear about it. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe related to that, you also look at kind of record replay sound bugs, like what was the last sound with record replay that you can use in computers to just uh, just record the number of the results of files. I mean, for example, in, in your example, you wouldn't have had to record the result of the app's function, really, because that's the general stuff. Mm -hmm. um, that if you only record then one two minutes of files, you can actually do this thing. Okay. Right. Thank you. Yeah.